I'm so anxious. Wow. What are you anxious about? People being mad at you? They won't be mad at you if they're not racist. And if they're racist, who cares if they're mad at you? They're racist. So, this video um, is gonna be a lot more serious than my other videos because of the current events happening in the world and, you know, being a person of color, it's directly affecting me. So I feel like even though it is not the place of black people to educate everyone else, I feel like I have to do something so that people understand the shit that they're doing is wrong. Um, so today we're going to talk about microaggressions. Uh, I know that like in the grand scheme of everything that we're fighting for right now, microaggressions might seem like very small and like not a big issue to focus on right now, but like alongside all of like the systemic issues we're trying to overcome, it's the day-to-day -day shit that really gets us bothered. Um, and I would like for a lot of it to stop, or at least people to be aware of it. Because I don't think, like, 99% of these things that white people are doing, they realize that they're doing. Which is, in itself, I would argue, a microaggression, um, and very annoying, and, like, an awful thing that I feel like I'm the only person noticing all these things. But they're real, and I'm gonna call some of them out right now. So that if you, a white person watching this possibly, realize that you have been doing some of these things, or in the future, catch yourself doing some of these things, you could stop, and you can be like, Oh, that's racist. I shouldn't do that. If this video feels all over the place, it's because the version that you guys are seeing is very different than the version I'm going to put out on my Instagram. If you want to see the version I put out on my Instagram, my Instagram's in the description. But this version is going to be a lot more spicy, there's going to be a lot more details, and it's going to be a lot longer. Um, the one on my Instagram is way more informative because in the end, this YouTube channel, yes, is for me, but I do want to make this video informative, but also like, when I started doing my notes for this video, it really got me hated about all of the racist shit that my school used to do and how I never realized it and how I was not able to speak up about it before. Um, but I've left since, so now I can say whatever the fuck I want without fear. Oh, what a good feeling. So, what is a microaggression? Um, you have Google, so Google's probably gonna give you a lot better definition than whatever I'm gonna say, but microaggression, also known as like subtle acts of exclusion, are just like tiny things that people do or say that like emphasize the point that you're different because of X, Y, or Z. It's meant to like exclude you even if the person saying or doing these things doesn't realize that they're doing them or does not have the intent to exclude you with their words or actions still a microaggression. And people of color, and all minorities and oppressed groups, specifically black people, because that's what we are focusing on right now, um, experience these every day, multiple times a day, for all of their life. Now, like I said, you can Google a bunch of examples and more categories on these. So I'm not gonna like go down a list and like give you a bunch of like basic examples. I'm going to be talking about my personal experiences with these. I know that most of these examples are not universal things that many people have experienced, but I don't know how else to come at this besides speaking about like the personal experiences that I have had. So these are very unique. These will probably never happen again, but still I think pretty strong examples of the point I'm trying to make, which is check your privilege. And I feel like a lot of these practices at the school need to be called out because I know at the very least I wasn't comfortable doing it when I was there, so I can't imagine anybody else would feel that comfortable doing it while they're there. But as most of you know, uh, for the first half of this year I went to a private performing arts school, and yes, the main reason I left was the $30,000 price tag. But the many microaggressions that I faced there and the subtle racism that I experienced basically every day did not help me in wanting to stay there. When a lot of people say, oh, that is racist, a lot of people want to think that it's like, like big boy racism, but y'all seen the triangle on Instagram by now, the one of like the hierarchy of like overt and covert racism. <laughs> this was a bunch of covert racism, is all of the things I'm gonna talk about. Nobody was like saying the N word because they were all liberal enough and PC enough and woke enough to like not do that shit. But like their implicit biases and their white privilege was never like checked enough for them to like not do the covert racisms. And if you know anything about the performing arts entertainment industry, it's all about who you know and you need the people that you know to like you. Because if they like you, then they'll put you in the things that they're producing or making or writing or whatever. And if they don't like you, then you don't get any work ever. 
Um, so a lot of these things I did realize and like was trying to work through while I was there, but didn't say anything because I was very worried that if I said something and I upset the wrong person, then like that would just ruin my entire career. But considering the political climate that we're in, if this ruins my career, then it ruins my career. Um, this matters a bit too much. So if you're one of the people involved in one of these situations that I'm talking about, um, maybe check your privilege. Maybe check the things that you do and just be a bit more aware going through life from here on out. Most of these experiences fall under this wonderful category that I found on the University of Washington's website and it perfectly articulates the very specific form of microaggression that I experienced most at this school which was uh, denial or devaluing of experience or culture, which means ignoring the existence, histories, cultures, or groups of people assuming that others are like you. Basically, just not recognizing the fact that not everybody might feel comfortable or included in a certain situation because of X, Y, or Z. Basically meaning that I was in a school, basically, just full of white people, and they never had to think about that the way that I had to think about that because when you are the only person singled out in a room, you feel that. But if you're not, then you don't notice it at all. That's the part of white privilege, is feeling included and thinking that everything is about you, basically. So when things aren't about you, you don't notice because it's not affecting you. Just to preface this, like I just mentioned, um, this school was full of white people, which I did not expect going into this because that was the first thing that I researched before going into any new school is the diversity like quotas and populations to see, you know, am I gonna be the only minority there? And they said, they advertised that there was only like 60% white people, 40% people of color. And like, maybe there was in the rest of the school, but in my department, that was not the case. At the end of the first year, which I didn't even make it to, I left at the end of the first semester, um, at the end of the first year, there were 30 white people and five people of color. And between then and the beginning of the year, three white people had dropped out and then me and another person of color dropped out. And also in terms of staff, uh, in my department, in my acting department, um, I had 10 teachers that I regularly interacted with on like a day-to-day -day basis between all my classes. And um, between all 10 of them, only two of them were people of color. So the lack of diversity, already very apparent by the time I step into a room. In my class though, there were 10 of us and only two of us were people of color and I was the only black person. Um, so in our acting class, we did scenes from A Raisin in the Sun and as you know if you've read the play or seen the play, that there is the use of the n-word in it by black people. And our teacher, who is a black man, asked the class if they would be comfortable hearing that word said by him in an academic setting. Because he was trying to see whether or not it's a thing that should be censored or should we leave it because that's the writer's intent or blah blah blah. That was the whole thing he was trying to gauge the class on. When he went around the room and asked the opinions, first everyone was quiet because they didn't want to say anything. I stayed quiet throughout this whole thing because I frankly did not really want to hear that. Um, don't like that word. <laughs> I think that's a pretty okay stance to have. Um, but I'm not gonna say all, but most of the white kids in the room went around and said, yeah, I'm okay with hearing it, as if that was their place at all. That really fucked me up. That's when I really realized, oh, this might be an issue like being here and working with these people. Like to think that not only as a non-black person, but as a white person, like a part of the oppressive group who use this word to oppress people like me, you would think that it was in any way your place to say that it was okay to hear that word in that classroom. This conversation truly went on for 20 minutes as they just sort of as like the white people just sort of went back and forth debating whether or not it was okay, but mostly just deciding that it was fine because they were like, yeah, it's the writer's intent and this is a classroom and if we can't, you know, make mistakes in the classroom, where can we ever make mistakes? And like, sure. And one of the guys in the class sort of skirted around the idea that it wasn't his place to say by saying, you know, like, I, this word's never been used against me. But when the teacher got down to it and was like, well, we need to come to a decision because we have to like move the class along, what do you guys say? The white people were like, yeah, I'm okay with it. And then me, the only black person in that class, did not say anything during that whole conversation. And 
it was just so very telling that all of these white people had never, it had never even crossed their mind that it wasn't even their place to say. That they were bolstered by such a strong amount of white privilege that they thought it was their place, that this was a decision that they were able to make. Like none of them came to the correct conclusion, which was, I, it's not my place. All of them were like, yes, I'm okay with this. That was just such a big turning point in being like, oh, I can't, I, I can't trust these people. <laughs> because yeah, sure, I'm great friends with a bunch of them, but like when it comes down to it, they have lived such a different life than I have. <laughs> And like, on paper, that's great, you know, diversity and learning from each other. But like, in that sort of situation, when you're so outnumbered, and you don't feel safe or comfortable to speak out against that, that is such an awful place to be. Like, that was such a horrible situation to put me in. And like, none of them realized what they were doing. This is the biggest issue with microaggressions, is that when people do it, they think that they're doing a good thing by being like, Oh, you know, we're gonna consider the fact that, like, I've never been oppressed with this word, so maybe I shouldn't say, but ultimately I think it's okay and that's what matters. And like, no, it doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter. Your, your white opinion on this matter doesn't matter. And they never, they never realized that. Also, the fact that that class was made up of white people and, like, our teacher, I'm not gonna argue with his decision because he probably knows way more than I do about it, but, like, the fact that he had a bunch of white kids do a play about systemic racism and expected them to like talk about issues that have never ever affected them. It blows my mind. Like who, what, who allowed that? Like sure, racism is a great play, great thing to learn about, but like to expect these kids to step into roles and have them basically believe that they understand what these characters are going through? Like no. The issues that these characters face are direct symptoms of an oppressive system used to oppress them and still oppress people to this day and they could never understand that ever they could never understand what it's like to be a black person in america like but the, I, i'm sure that at least some of them came out of that thinking that they did and i'm like no it doesn't matter how much you research about the history of being black or how much you spend time thinking about what these characters were thinking about you will never be black and you will never understand and on top of that, when a bunch of kids went to go do their, like, whole, like, performance at the end, when they've, like, worked on their scene with their partners and, like, showed it to the class for, like, um, feedback or whatever, a bunch of those kids did a black scent. And it really threw- I just- Who allowed them to do that? I think that they thought that they were just doing regular Chicago accents, but they were not. Those were definitely black scents. And I don't think they realized that at all. And- that's what really throws me for a loop. Like, how do I even, I don't even know where to start with that. Like, how do I even start explaining that what they're doing is wrong if they don't even see that they're doing anything wrong? That was a whole thing. And like, to get back to the educational part of it, um, that's a microaggression. They didn't realize that what they were doing was wrong. And does it like physically hurt me? No. But did it mentally fuck me up? Yes, it did. And it's such a small thing that you wouldn't even think that it like mattered at all. But like, this shit happened maybe like eight months ago and I'm still upset about it. Like as the only black student in that room to hear a bunch of white people stake their claim and inadvertently say, it is my place to speak on this subject was just so like disrespectful <laughs> on like a level I can't even explain. I'm still, I'm still trying to like work through how best to explain and articulate that experience for myself. But I truly, I haven't been able to. <laughs> but hopefully you understand that that shit's not okay. If you're a white person, your opinion on the n-word is null and void. You should not have an opinion on it because it's not your place. <laughs> it's like if you've never broken your arm and then someone who has broken their arm many times is like, wow, this is super painful. And then for you to be like, no, it's not. Like, you don't know. You've never broken your arm. You've never had the n-word used against you as a way to oppress you. It's not even a thing where you should be like, we should not hear this word. You shouldn't have an opinion, period. It should not be a topic that should be brought up to you. You should not have it. This should not be, this isn't your place. Anyways, I'm rambling, moving on. Um, another wonderful microaggression that still actively traumatizes me to this day. Um, not to get into the fact that acting classes like to like traumatize you in order for you to like use that pain and like really connect with your emotions and to let go. 
let's not even talk about that whole bullshit. We had this whole um, course in our acting class where we had to recite a poem through a bunch of different exercises. And it was a poem that they said really should speak to you as a person so that you would feel connected saying it over and over and over again. So I picked Who Said It Was Simple by Audre Lorde. And that poem is about the struggles of not only being a woman, but particularly a black woman and about the struggles for equality. And the last line of the poem is literally, which of me will survive all these liberations? It's literally about not knowing how your identity will fare after trying to get past all this oppression. It's a whole thing. I really connected to it. And we had to say it for a bunch of different exercises. In one of these exercises, um, we were supposed to say it to a partner who's like walking away from us and then every so often they would turn around and say I'm listening or I hear you or something and like that shit was already fucked up enough to like literally be speaking about the, the oppression that I experience on a day-to-day -day basis being part of marginalized communities to a white man and then having him turn around and say I hear you or I'm listening like that's fucked up do you get that? In a world in which black people and women still don't have equality, to have a man with both of those privileges say he's listening in a world in which they don't actually listen, isn't that just so fucked up to have that happen? And it had like in the exercise, it happens multiple times. Like I'm speaking the words and then he'll turn around and say I'm listening, and then he'll turn back around and like stop listening, and that's supposed to like drive you to like want him to listen and you're supposed to like use your words and like the feelings that guide you or whatever to like push him to hear you as if the actual message isn't like the actual fight that I'm having currently for equal rights in America like do you get do you get that that's fucked up it's like you know how in the world symbolically nobody's listening because sure they're hearing your words but like the idea and the symbol of like white men who have all the power are not like actually like listening as like a group as this like abstract concept of them but then like I actually had to confront that in like face to face like it was literally me being like hello I'm oppressed I'm part of all these marginalized communities and then he representing the oppressor would be like, I'm listening, and then I would be speaking, and then he would turn back around and walk away. And it's like, that's so hurtful. Because if that was like a real life situation, do you know how like upset that would make anybody? But I had to like do it. And I had to do it over and over and over again. And then, because that wasn't enough, our teacher was like, let's just throw in some fun surprises so that you can think on your feet or whatever. I don't even remember the point of that lesson because I'm still so upset about what happened. The teacher told my partner to go do something. I didn't know what he was gonna do, but you know, I kept doing the thing where I'm just like following after him, begging him to listen about my oppression. <laughs> and then he like runs out of the room and I'm like, okay, I have to follow him. That's the rules of this game. And then I follow him out and we run back and down the, up and down the hallway a few times, you know, as theater kids do and then he runs back into the room and then um as he's running in through the room um all of the other kids in the class because you know we do these as a class it's not just a one-on-one -on -one thing all the other kids in the class as i've already mentioned who are white except for one um were told which i did not know to grab me and physically hold me back from being able to get to him and say these words just like think about what that like means and what that like feels like for a second to you know be a person talking about your oppression to an oppressor and having a bunch of other people who also symbolize that same type of oppression physically hold you back from saying these words about your oppression physically silencing you and I paid money to do that can you believe and like the worst part which was a thing that nobody truly could have accounted for, is that when, you know, like, eight other people are trying to grab onto one person, that's just not gonna happen, like, physically. So one person grabbed me right underneath my ribs. And you know what's right underneath your ribs? Your lungs. So somebody physically, like, pinched my lungs. So I literally had no air to say all these words. The idea that I couldn't actually breathe saying these words in this context can you imagine um, the trauma? <laughs>
Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the microaggressions? Because was this purposeful? No. I doubt that any of these white people realized the shit they were doing. Um, but regardless, this was just one of the many ways that their white privilege manifested in these classrooms. Like, their white privilege blinded them from being able to see these disparities between me and them. Like, sure, we all love to sing Kumbaya and yeah, we're all one together, whatever. I am me, we are together, whatever the fuck. But like, when it comes down to it, if you're going to have me say a poem about being oppressed, <laughs> Two people who have historically oppressed me and then had them physically stop me from saying these words. Um, it's gonna hurt just a tiny bit, not gonna lie. I still don't know how to fully articulate this pain that it put me through. And there's nothing that can be done about it. And that's the worst part about this situation is that like for the other one, people can like catch themselves before they do stupid shit like that before saying, oh, maybe I don't have an opinion on the N word. But when it comes down to shit like this, this is such a very specific, unique situation that truly won't happen in the real world, but is just a thing that still bothers me. So I feel the need to mention it. Um, and there was nothing that could have been done. Like whoever grabbed me, I still don't know who it was. Whoever grabbed me didn't know what they were doing. They couldn't have known what they were doing. And I doubt that the teacher would have assumed that it would have affected me in this way, even though, even if you think about it just like a little bit beforehand about the implications of what I'm saying and about who these people are and who I am as a person, that you would think maybe we don't do this <laughs> this way, maybe we do it a different way. But once the damage is done, it's done. Like, even if all these people were to come up to me now and say, I'm so sorry that that happened, I didn't mean to, I'd be like, yes, thank you. But regardless, it's happened <laughs> and it has hurt me and there's nothing that we can do about it now. <laughs> but that's not all. <laughs> one of the other truly microaggressions in comparison to that last one um, that I experienced was in our sort of, let's just call it PE for the simplicity of it all. In our PE class, um, our teacher would play some music when we would work out in order to like encourage us or whatever. And I already had a bunch of issues with that class as it was for like, other reasons that I'm not going to get into because it's not relevant. Um, but whenever he would play music, he would play almost exclusively white artists. You might not think that this is like a big deal, but if I have to explain why diversity is important, then we're, we need to take like 10 steps back and like, this isn't the video for you. If you don't understand why diversity is important, you gotta, you got some more education to do before you come back to this video. But diversity is important. And, you know, when the purpose of this music is to encourage people and have people, like, feeling connected and together, having the music not include you is not helpful towards that goal. You see, um, especially since a lot of the music was, like, I think it was, like, 80s pop, but it was exclusively, like, white people pop. Like, sure, like, music isn't just for a certain group, but, like, I didn't know, like, the majority of the songs that they were playing, but all the other white kids in my class did. So like, not only does that make me, as a person of color, feel very excluded by the fact that, oh, my people and my cultures are not represented in this music that we're all sharing together, but also it's clear that this type of music is a thing that brought the white people together, but not people like me. Because I don't know these songs that they're all singing along to and enjoying, and it just sort of makes this whole experience feel that much worse. And again, this is not a thing that was intentional by any of the white people in that class, I'm pretty sure. They probably just didn't notice. Again, because they are blinded by their white privilege. Like I just said, that microaggression category, the denial of cultures, like, they just assume everything is about them. And that the, the way that they've experienced life is the way that everybody else has experienced life. So when they just hear a bunch of, like, poppy 80s songs made by all white people, they don't, it doesn't register like that in their mind. They're just like, oh, fun songs. Whereas me, a person of color, and like, oh, this is a lot of white people. And I once again feel excluded. It was just not a fun feeling. Especially since on top of that, because our PE class was co-taught by um, a white man and then a black woman. I love her. She was a great teacher. Um, when she was doing the exercises with us, she asked us, what music we wanted to listen to versus when he did it, he just sort of put on music 
that he already liked that was predominantly white people. I think there might have been maybe one or two songs by people of color in like the hundreds of songs that we listened to throughout that semester. Um, and then when he gave us like options of songs, they were like this white artist or this white artist. There was never like a person of color or other culture option. But when our other teacher, when she wanted to play music for us because everyone was like, let's play some music because that's what they were used to. She asked us, what do you want to listen to? And me finally feeling included for the first time was like, can we listen to anything by a person of color, please? And all the white people got real silent. And I don't know if it was because they didn't know how to take that request or because they thought that I was just overreacting or I was being stupid with that, but I genuinely, truly needed to hear a song by a person of color in order to just feel like I wasn't the only person of color in the world in that moment. There was a weird feeling in that room and I don't know how to describe it. I don't know if I was just like projecting onto it, but it truly felt after I said that, that like all the white people in the room were like, mm. and that again is not a fun feeling, but I doubled down on it because I was like, I swear to God, I need to hear just one song by a person of color, please. And again, see, that's a microaggression, small, tiny things, small, probably imperceivable things to white people because they have their white privilege glasses on and they can't see that shit. But when you're a person of color, that's all that you can see because it's directed specifically at you. Another thing that truly blew my mind when I got there and then also a thing that I re-realized once I'd left was that when I auditioned, I auditioned for a panel of exclusively four white people. And during that audition, when they do the interview after you do your whole monologue song, blah, 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 they were like, why do you want to go to the school? I said, I really want to work with a diverse group of people because like I said, I'd read on their website that they were a lot more diverse than they actually were. Um, and I said specifically that I hated feeling like the only minority in the room. And then they put me in a class where I was the only minority in the room, save for one. But even then, I was the only Asian person in that room and I was the only black person in that room. And again, that just goes back to the microaggression of thinking everything's about you, not realizing that that's an issue, not seeing the lack of diversity because a lack of diversity has never affected you. Like rarely will you ever be the only white person in the room, but I am the only minority in the room most of the time. And it's not a good feeling. And I specifically said, I don't like that. <laughs> and then they put me in that situation anyways, because despite me clearly telling them that, their white privilege doesn't register that as an issue in their mind when they're all putting it all together. They don't think, oh, this group might need some more diversity, a bit more perspectives going into it. And it's not from like a lack of auditioning, because in my audition group there were six of us, four of us were people of color, two of them were white, both of the white people got in, and only two of us who were the people of color got in. And that other person of color who auditioned with me was the only other person of color I saw that whole year, because she was the only person of color in my class. Throughout our entire first year department, like our whole first year theater department, there was not a single black man, <laughs> not one. I didn't even realize that until I started writing notes for this video. There was not a single black man in our year. That's how crazy this was. <laughs> and yeah, I know I can't say any of this for like 100% certain because people are mixed and like the color of your skin doesn't determine what your culture is slash race slash whatever, but nobody was clearly a person of color. <laughs> other than the people that I could see, other than like the seven of us. And if you're only getting minorities that are white passing, then that's already a different issue within itself. That's a whole colorism issue that we're not gonna get into right now. But basically, I was the only black person and the only Asian person in my class most of the time. And that's not a comforting, safe, encouraging environment to be in, especially when they encourage you to like work on and work with like text and pieces that like speak to who you are and something that you really connect to. And that's clearly gonna be the pieces of my identity, be it race, um, gender, other parts of me that are oppressed, etc. And then have me say all those things to a room full of people who have been brought up with so much privilege that they can't even understand 
that they shouldn't have an opinion on the n-word. Like that's, it was not a environment that would foster growth because it doesn't foster safety. Like sure, physically felt fine, but emotionally and mentally, I knew that like it would not take long for somebody to say something that would be like truly too far. Another thing though, um, teachers really like to include things that were not part of their culture as a way to like use those techniques to like teach in our classes. And like, I'm all for that. I think that's great to like share in other cultures in order for us to all like learn together. Two things that we specifically learned about were the Suzuki method and Ubuntu, which is this like African philosophy about like, I am we and we are all one together, stuff like that. And the idea behind it is great, but it's also very weird to be hearing that in a room lacking diversity. Like, yes, I love to be hearing about things from like Japanese culture and African culture, but when there are no Japanese or African people in the room, it just sort of feels kind of culture vulture-y, you know? Just sort of like, you want to take these things from our culture, but you don't actually want us here in the room with you. And that's again, just, you know, a thing that I doubt any of these white people realized that they were doing. Because I'm sure that they're just like, this is a great method that I learned and I want to share that with these students, but also like, if you're just taking these things from these cultures and then not allowing these people from these cultures to be in these classrooms, I just feel like you're just doing the same thing that's been done for hundreds of years, which is stealing our culture and then excluding us from being a part of it. And it's just, it's not a fun feeling. And I know I'm not the only one who's experienced this because I've talked to a few of my other friends who were the very few people of color that went there and they also agree that like some of the shit that happened was not okay. <laughs> and you can say what you want about microaggressions, be it they're too small and the people shouldn't be so sensitive and blah, 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 blah. But like, as we've seen from this civil war that is happening right now, it matters on every level. Being anti-racist is important on every level. Be it the giant systemic problems we're having now with the police or the day-to-day -day shit like this. I don't want any of the people who were involved in these situations to like message me or anything and like apologize for what they did. I don't, I don't need apologies. That's not gonna fix any of this. Um, I just want all the white people seeing this and all the people who come from privileged positions to see this and just think about the things that they're doing as they're doing them. Because when you come from a place of privilege, it's difficult to see that, you know, some people are not experiencing these situations the same way that you are. And hopefully this sheds some light on some situations in which you might have been acting poorly and you might have been subconsciously excluding people. If you take away one thing from this video, I just hope it's to be more mindful and to be more aware of the way that you're interacting with and talking about people and start examining your unconscious bias. Like, why don't you notice a lack of diversity in the situations you're in? And if you do notice them, why aren't you saying anything about it? The only way for us as marginalized communities to get full equality in this world is for people in privileged positions to recognize their privilege and actively work against it. That is the only way this is gonna happen. So just like think to yourself in your daily life, what can you do to be more inclusive of other people? What can you do to check your unconscious bias that is causing these microaggressions in your day-to-day -day interactions? This is sometimes a lot smaller than just like locking your car doors if a person of color is walking by or saying things like, where are you really from? Or you speak really good English. Like, yes, that shit's racist, don't do it. But sometimes you can fully think that you're woke or PC or progressive, and you can still be contributing to the levels of white supremacy and racism in this country with your microaggressions. Just like, don't stop trying to improve yourself and working on ways for you to be less racist. Like you can think that you're not racist and sometimes you still are, but you can fix that. You can actively work against your white privilege to fix that. And for the love of God, if you see this shit happening, you, the person with all the privilege, need to call it out. Because more likely than not, the person who is being attacked by these microaggressions has experienced them multiple times that day. And we have to pick and choose our battles. Sometimes we can't get into a 10, 15, 30 minute argument about why what you said was wrong. We 
rely on and we need the people around us to also check that bullshit. So it's fine and dandy for you to, you know, march in the protests, sign the petitions, donate to these organizations. We need that so much. But it also comes down to the day-to-day -day shit. If you're not, you know, checking the next time that your aunt says something racist about immigrants, or the next time your friend makes a black joke, or when someone asks you, how do you feel about hearing the N-word as a person who's never been oppressed by it? You just need to like stop that and you need to recognize your privilege and cut it off right there. And it's just ironically, the most harmful thing to me is the fact that they don't even notice this. Like there was a great quote, oh my goodness, I cannot remember who said it. And I can't even remember the exact quote, but it, the gist of it is, um, I, I think it was Martin Luther King. I could be so wrong. Um, I am way more scared of the white moderate than I am of like the full-blown racist because the full-blown racist we can like avoid and like not have to deal with. But these seemingly PC liberal people who like support us are the most dangerous ones because you think you can trust them and then they do shit like that. And then they're like, oh no, wait, we can't. That's the most harmful thing about this is that nobody there realized what they were doing. Not even the teachers. Like, I don't think any of them realized the harmful effects that they were having on the marginalized people in their room. Mostly probably because there weren't many of us. They probably haven't had to accommodate many people of color and many diverse cultures because it is mostly white people in that department. That is just the thing that upset me the most is that like, yes, all these awful microaggressions I did have to experience and I still am upset about to this day, like eight months later. But the fact that nobody realized that this was happening except for me is the most upsetting thing. Because to me, it's so obvious that if you're just, if you just take a second to think about, you know, the other people in this, if you just take a second to think about the people that you could be affecting by this, you would realize that the shit that you're doing is not okay. But they're not, they're not taking the time to think of this through. They're only thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about how their actions could hurt others. They're only thinking about what they're doing and what is comfortable to them. It never crosses their mind that the things that they're doing could be harmful to others. And that is white privilege. The privilege to be ignorant to the pain of others. Like, I wish I didn't notice these things. I wish these things didn't affect me in the way that they did, but they did. And there's nothing that I can do about it now. Maybe if one of those white people in the class spoke up and said, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this, or maybe this isn't our place to say, I wouldn't be having these issues, but they didn't. So I'm just hoping that by saying all these things and you listening to all these experiences, you really just think the next time you're doing something. <laughs> You just check your white privilege. You examine the ways that it might hurt or affect the people around you so that less of this shit happens. You know, we're all clearly trying to fight basically a war against racism. And, you know, these tiny microaggressions are not helping. It's going to be a death by a thousand paper cuts, if not death by the police. I just hope that, like, one person, one white person who watches this actually, like, sits and examines the shit that they do. Because that will make this all worth it. I've been talking for over an hour of just trying to figure out the best words to say. And they're in here somewhere, so I hope that you listened. And I hope that you really think through the ways that your white privilege is helping you and protecting you and blinding you from the injustices that others face. And the next time that a situation like this or like any other of the million microaggressions that could occur happens, that you stop it. You stop yourself and you stop others so that this doesn't have to happen anymore, okay? We're so tired of fighting. We have been fighting for hundreds of years. We were so tired of fighting. We just want this to stop. So if you could help by like, just being like a little bit less racist and stopping the day-to-day -day racism, that would be amazing. <laughs> my notes. It's 3.45 in the morning, but we're gonna do this. We're gonna make a video and it's gonna be good.